All right, I'm going to go through an interesting, interesting chapter of this book here. It's called Repentance of Sin, How Antinomianism Disarmed the Gospel and Not the Sinner. It's by a uh, street preacher named Joshua Jocelyn. He runs uh, Truth, and Mercy ba Truth and Mercy Baptist Ministries. And uh, this book I got off Amazon, it's written by him. It goes through basically how repentance of sin is not work salvation in that basically goes through a refutation of easy believism and antinomianism and he shows that you know this antinomianism heresy of there's no repentance there's no you know moral law god expects you to follow after salvation you know he goes through that and refutes that and this is a book that a lot of the steve nanson group and the you know antinomianism crowd don't like like the jack hiles crowd the jack smack 7 7 cult the steven anderson crowd uh, they keep trying to refute this book. Like one of them did a video, videos trying to refute this book, but they really can't. Now, I don't agree with everything in this book. Um, there is some stuff like the whole non dispensational aspect, and you know, some stuff I don't totally agree with, but he does have some very good information in this book that go through biblical repentance and refute the heresy of antinomianism. Now, again, there are some things in here I don't totally agree with, like certain various certain definitions of repentance. Because um, repentance in the context of salvation, he does go through this as well, that it includes God this sorrow over your sins, being contrite and broken over your sins. It does include that, absolutely. And that's something that the easy believism, uh, Jack Smack 77, Jack Heil, Stephen Anderson, that crowd don't, don't like. They hate the idea of being contrite over your sins, over being a wicked sinner, and you come into God and God this sorrow that work with repentance to salvation in accordance to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 8 to 11. But a specific chapter I want to go through is uh, chapter 7 about uh, being saved from sin and it goes through the antinomianism heresy and basically describes that and refutes it. So I'll read that. So this is uh, chapter 7 page 125 of Repentance of Sin, How Antinomianism Disarmed the Gospel and Not the Sinner. So he quotes the first scripture, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You see, save them in their sins. Not, f not, sorry, save them from their sins, not save them in their sins. Sorry, got messed up there for a second. But he came to save his people. Who are his people? Israel. He came to save them from their sins, not in their sins. That's something that the whole Jack Smack 7 7 crowd and the Stephen Anderson cult, the Jack Hiles cult, don't like. The ancient antinomianisms did not antinomians did not consider the law to be of use in the Christian life or the gospel, nor did they thus consider transgression that law transgression of that law sin to be significant to either. Uh, likewise, modern antinomians antinomians have little regard for God's law and thus do not view salvation through God's eyes but man's. To the modern antinomian, the gospel saves unbelievers from unbelief, so they can go to heaven. But God. But to God, the gospel saves sinners from their sin and pays their sin debt so they can be conformed to his image. Exactly. The change life after salvation. You know, like Ephesians 2.10 says, you're created for his, you know, you're created for good works. You're his workmanship created for good works. Paraphrasing, of course. Like Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14 talks about how God would, you know, have a peculiar people zealous of good works, referring to Christians in that, in that passage there, that context. Uh, Having established that the gospel requires repentance from sin, let us now turn our attention to the question of why. What is the purpose of the gospel, and why is repentance of, from sin such an integral, integral part of it? So he says, why are sinners damned? The first issue uh, that must be addressed is just, uh, it is just what it is that sends a person to hell. Why are sinners damned? Is it unbelief that damns them, or sin, which you know unbelief is sin, obviously, but unbelief is not the only sin that will damn you to hell. Uh, I mean, unbelief can damn you to hell. It is definitely a sin, but is it the only one? That's what he, that's what he kind of addresses. To the antinomian, the idea that sin would be of so would be so significant as to send somebody to hell is utterly repugnant. After all, God is a loving and forgiving God, and sin is just quote missing the mark unquote. Yeah, that's what that's what a lot of them think. You know, uh, where was the? If went too far. Yeah, page one twenty six. Uh, how could a little thing like sin be the cause for God to send somebody to hell? Jack, Sma Jack Hiles, I almost said Jack Smack 7 7, which they have the same spirit anyway. They have the same wicked, uh, angry, bitter, uh, sinful spirit. The, the 
this hatred, this hatred for biblical repentance and godly sorrow over your sins. Jack Hiles, the pastor of First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana, was renowned for his gross immorality, propelled, uh, propelled antinomianism to prominence among fundamentalists in the late 20th century. Uh, he came out solidly in favor of, of the view that it is only unbelief that damns a sinner. To Hiles, as well as many thousands of minds he influenced, the only reason someone goes to hell was because they did not believe on Christ. Therefore, the only sin that must be repented of to be saved is unbelief. In other words, the moment a lost soul turns away from unbelief to belief they are saved. Hiles had to say this widely, had to say this, sorry, had this to say in his widely circulated enemies of soul winning. Quote, a person does not who does not believe is condemned, so not believing is what makes a person lost. We have to repent only of the thing that makes us unsaved, that is unbelief. Now, what's going on is that the, the easy believism antinomian heretics, because not every easy believism uh, person is an antinomian. There are some easy believists that do preach against sin, but some of them, like Jack Hiles, are antinomians. And what they're basically doing is they're saying, well, because you have to believe on Jesus Christ for salvation, that means only unbelief damns you to hell. Well, no, all sin is transgression of God's law. All sin will send you to hell. So as a result of being a wicked sinner and your sin damning you to hell, you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, It's not only the sin of unbelief that will send you to hell. Okay, You put your faith in Jesus Christ, and then as a result, the sins that are sending you, sending you to hell are washed and forgiven. And then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, according to Ephesians 1.13, Ephesians 4.30, and 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. That's what they're confusing. They're confusing the single sin of unbelief, as in that's the only sin that sends you to hell, when really all sin sends you to hell. So you put your faith in Jesus Christ to have those sins that are sending you to hell washed away. So yeah, that's what, something they can't understand. It is certainly logical to conclude that one must repent of that which makes one lost. But this is the height of logical absurdity to conclude that the thing that makes one lost is not believing in, in that which saves. This is circular. Circular. The situation can be illustrated by the metaphor of a snake bite vit victim. If someone is bitten by a very venomous snake and dies at the at the corner, would no doubt conclude that the person had died from the venom of the of the snake. But if that snake bite victim was given the opportunity to receive an anti venom to counteract the venom and refused it, the cause of death would still be the snake bite's vi venom. In such a case, the corner. The coroner, yeah, uh, would never conclude that the cause of death was refusal to, was refusal to accept the anti venom. Anyone reading such a report would ask what had happened to the victim to require him to need the anti venom in the first place. The, uh, though the victim most likely would have survived if he had accepted the medicine, it was not the lack of the, of the anti venom medicine that killed him. It was still the venom likewise. The sinner uh, will be saved if he repents in true faith, yet it is not his lack of faith that sends, that starts him on the path to hell. Damnation is not only the result of unbelief, or is not the result of unbelief through trusting in Jesus Christ, though trusting in Jesus Christ would certainly counter it. Damnation is a result of sin. Uh, that This is the, not only logical, but the clear teaching of scripture. Consider Paul's anointing of the origin of death in his epistle to the Romans. He says, what so, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so, pass, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And he's quoting from Romans chapter 5, saying that basically Adam, through his sin, we're all made sinners now because of him. So what do you do to have those sins washed away? What do you do to have that snake bite venom washed away? You take the medicine. Well, Jesus Christ in Mark 2.17 said that they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. Basically, if, you don't, if you're not sick, you don't need to go to the doctor. Well, if you're not a sinner, you don't need to go to the Savior to have your sins washed away. That's what Jesus is comparing it to. So if you're, if you're the snake bite victim, you need the medicine to get that venom washed away. Well, when you have the spiritual venom of sin, you need to go to the Savior to get that washed away. Not just putting your faith, you actually have to go to Jesus Christ, get saved, Okay, faith is part of salvation, absolutely. Okay, but you go to Jesus Christ and He washes away your sins. Okay, not just the sin of unbelief. Okay, but He washes away your all your sins, past, present, and future. You can see that in Acts thirteen thirty nine, uh, Colossians two thirteen, Titus two fourteen, and First John one seven. All your sins washed away. You put your faith in Jesus Christ, and then the sin of unbelief and all your other sins, not just the sin of unbelief, are washed away. Absolutely. Faith alone is not scriptural at all. Faith, the term faith alone does not appear in scripture, except in James 2.17, where it's actually condemning it. Okay? You're saved by grace through faith. God's grace, 
your faith. Okay? Absolutely. It's not faith alone. It's not, that title does not appear in Scripture. Faith alone. Uh, yeah, what is it? He's quoting from Romans chapter 5. Let me try to find that Scripture. Romans chapter 5. I think he's... I think it's verse 12. Yeah, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so that, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Absolutely. And Jesus Christ paid the penalty for your sins, so you go to him to have your snake bite venom, your spiritual venom of sin, washed away. Uh, what is it? So it says, Sin brought death into the world. Before Adam sin, man was to live forever, but sin changed everything. Yeah, the reason why we even have a physical, the reason why humans can have health problems, the reason why we can experience physical death, the reason why when you get older, your body decays and you have more health complications is because of sin. You have a corruptible, sinful body. Your body is corruptible. You know, you will not get a, a perfectly pure body until the rapture. Let me try to find that verse. Paul talks about that. Let me try to get that verse pulled up. But the reason why, you know, if, if this coronavirus thing is, is actually as deadly as some people would say, the reason why it's such a health risk is because, here's why, Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. Uh, actually, let me go to, let's go to the full verse there. Uh, here it is. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. For our conversation is in heaven, for once we look also, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Search all the post-tribbers out there. We're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for the Savior, Jesus Christ. But what does Paul say will happen in verse 21? Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working thereby, he is able to sub even to subdue all things unto himself. That's Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. Okay, Our bodies are vile. Our bodies are, are disgusting and sinful. Romans chapter 8 verse 3 talks about how Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. You have health problems, you, have, you can get headaches, you know, you can have, the reason why you get tired and you have to sleep at night is because you have a sinful body. Sin is the cause of pretty much every health problem, every single death in human history. And how do you get that sin washed away? Through Jesus Christ. Uh, where is it? So it, says, so it says, it doomed him to a physical death, but also to an eternal death, what the Bible calls the second death. In the lake of fire, indeed, uh, in the very next chapter, Paul contrasts eternal life with the death brought about by sin by making the point that sin results in eternal death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeah, that's Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. Not just a sin of unbelief, but sin in general. The wages of sin is death. Okay, You told a lie, you, you use profanity, the wages of sin is death. So again, how do you get that sin washed away? Only through Jesus Christ. You know, uh, John 14, uh, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ speaking there. You know, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what Jesus Christ says. Um, so he says, but Paul uses even stronger language elsewhere in the New Testament. So there will be no doubt uh, as to why a loving and merciful God eternally damns souls to hell. And he by no mean la la he by no means lays the blame entirely at the feet of unbelief. In fact, he provides a list of sins that bring eternal wrath of God upon the sinner. It says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil uh, uh, con concipients. Not good at reading it, sorry, I, just, I might just... I hope I'm saying that word right. E evil constituents uh, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things the sake for which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. Okay, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but basically, he goes into uh, also Ephesians chapter five verses five to six. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So, that's uh, chapter 7, or sorry, chapter what chapter was it? It was chapter sorry, I forgot the yeah, chapter 7 of Repentance of Sin, how antinomianism disarmed the gospel and not the sinner. And he just shows that basically repentance of sin is not just simply turning from the sin of unbelief, it's turning from sin, because sin damns you to hell. All sin will send you to hell, not just the sin of unbelief. So again, don't agree with everything in this book. Uh, Repentance is saying how antinomianism disarmed the gospel and not the sinner, but he does bring up some good points. So if you're if you know your scripture, like if you know if you know dispensationalism, then you should get this book because he does 
say some non-dispensational things, but those of you who know your Bible know that dispensationalism is, is true. So you just kind of, you kind of just have to chew up, chew up the chew the meat and spit out the bones, you know, uh, because no man is perfect. Some people have errors, and I don't agree with him on everything, but he is spot on with the thing of this antinomianism heresy, this wicked heresy, that there's no repentance of sin involved in salvation. There's no godly contrite sorrow over your being a wicked sinner. That it's just a sin of unbelief and then you can just live however you want and there's no chastening of God, there's no conviction. It's wicked. It's an end times heresy. So, yeah. Uh, again, it's a pretty good book. Uh, so I recommend getting it. If you know your Bible well, because he does go in some, in some deep doctrine. Don't be deceived by antinomianism. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye. Thank you.